I really had difficulty preparing for this morning. I mean, in my in myself, I was preparing a certain message, and then I just was in turmoil over it, and something wasn't right. And then I don't know when it was, but I, I started to realize the Lord wanted to go through some of the foundational principles that we've been sharing over the past couple of weeks. I was thinking of moving on, talking about the church and using the book of Corinthians to kind of show and demonstrate how God um, builds a church to give us the encouragement in our own midst. But I really felt like we needed to go back and review the principles of what a church doesn't do and how we don't conform ourselves to the world. And so let's just talk through some of these principles again. And the main question we want to ask for this morning, do we want a church built by man or a church that's built by God? If I can, I don't think this is a too strong of a statement at all. Many, if not most, churches today, especially in America, are very, very corrupt. And they are trying to build an institution or an enterprise using human wisdom, worldly methods, and how can we know the difference? Very important that we're able to distinguish between the two. There are many people today involved in church ministry that will tell you, if your church is not growing numerically, it's a dead church. Because after all, living things grow, right? If your church is not growing financially, if your church is not growing in the number of extracurricular services and activities that you're providing for the community, I don't buy any of that. And you know why? Because I know that what we have here in this room is very much alive, very much growing, that God is present in our midst, that we are loving and serving each other more and more. We're lifting each other up more and more. And that is what a church assembly is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a refuge. It's supposed to be a place where you can come and receive strength and encouragement and correction when needed and instruction. And remember what I said last week, when you look at Corinthians, Timothy, both, Corinthians, both, the book of Titus, those are the New Testament how-to books. Those are the operating manuals for the church. This is how you do church. And in all of those epistles, there is not one mention of metrics in attendance or fundraising or budgets or anything that America has been concerned with. And what happens is that churches in America have conformed to the way of thinking in our American culture. And we have financial advisors today that will tell you that greed is good. Greed used to be a bad word. But that greed is good and that without greed, you won't have the grit or the determination to stick with it and do whatever it takes to get rich. And see, we have adopted that mentality of the church that bigger has to be better. We have to focus on buildings and programs and celebrity pastors, and we've got to appeal to the world and somehow bring them in without offending them. And that is not the church. That is a corporate enterprise. That is a business venture. And that is exactly how many of these churches operate, and that's exactly how many of these pastors see themselves. So here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says to Timothy, and this is one of those how-to, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead. So he's giving this young pastor, Timothy, a charge, and he, he, it's, the, it's the most solemn, severe charge that you could give them 
I'm giving you this jar charge in the presence of Jesus Christ, who you will answer to one day. And Timothy, I just want to remind you that you will stand before the holy judge and give an account of how well you carried out this charge that I'm giving you. I charge you in the presence of God, meaning this, Timothy, I didn't make this up. This isn't me talking. This is God giving you a command. And this is his command. Preach the word. Don't preach anything else. Remember what we'll see here in a moment where Paul told the Corinthians, I purposed in my heart to know nothing among you, nothing else except Christ and him crucified. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Because there's going to come a time when you're preaching out of season. There's going to become a time when, when you're preaching and nothing is growing. There's going to come a time when everything, you know, is kind of gray and dead and it's not lush and green like it is when it's in season. And in those times of outer, at when, when you're preaching out of season, you can't become discouraged and think, well, I need to change the message to get some results. He's saying, preach the word when everything is lush and green and growing, and preach the word when everything is dead and gray and still, and don't change course. No matter what you see with your eyes or hear with your ears, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience. It's going to take patience because you're going to be preaching to people who don't want to hear it. You're going to be preaching to people who don't want to be offended or challenged. You're going to be preaching to people who don't want to surrender their will to the lordship of Jesus. And the last thing they want to hear is the word of God. So when you're preaching and people are getting mad at you and they take you out into the streets and stone you and leave you for dead and throw you in prison and beat you with rods... Don't stop preaching. Don't let anything deter you, hinder you from preaching the word of God, whether you're getting results or not, because the truth is the truth and it needs to be spoken. For the time is coming. And, you know, I think, uh, I think the time had already come, to be honest with you. It's definitely come in our day. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Reminds me, I, I came across it again this morning. Charles Spurgeon, remember that line? What did he say? He said, there, there will come a day when uh, shepherds are no longer teaching the sheep, but clowns are entertaining the goats. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here in verse 3. They have itching ears. They don't want to surrender their will. They don't want to live for Jesus. And they want to hear a message that makes that okay. And they want to hear how I will prosperous and be great and be rich and famous and I will succeed at everything I do. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and they will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. Oh, there, there will be a spattering of scripture mixed in and religious slogans so that it kind of sounds okay. But the message of the cross will be left out. The offense of the cross will be left out. The fact that I must deny all, take up my cross and follow him will definitely be left out. The fact that God is a holy God and he doesn't dwell among a sinful people, that part will be left out. And it will all be soothing, smooth things that don't ruffle any feathers or get anybody upset. He said, that is what we're dealing with. And so, Timothy, you, with complete patience, complete patience, never get tired of teaching the word, no matter what the results are. 
because he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. And unfortunately, many pastors today are not pastors, they're peddlers. And you can see there what the definition of peddling is, at least in this uh, Greek definition. It means to make money by selling. It means to corrupt, to adulterate. What it means is you're shifting, you're manipulating the product to make the product more pleasing to the ears, to those that are buying. And he said, we don't do that. We don't peddle the Word of God. We don't leave certain things out to suit the hearers. We don't change things to make it easier on the hearers. But we are men of sincerity as commissioned by God, and in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And if you look across the American church, they are peddling the Word of God in these three ways. Number one, they're bringing in worldly growth strategies of branding and marketing into the church. And they're developing celebrity pastors. And it goes both ways. There's there's either celebrity pastors or domineering pastors. But it's all about getting people, keeping people, Pastors who are willing to say anything just to keep people from coming, just to keep people coming back. In the messages, they're appealing to carnal desires and human wisdom. Messages are more like stories, kind of self-help, God is great and will make you great type motivational speaking. And thirdly, they remove any offense of the, of the cross. They remove the lordship of Jesus and holiness. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, My dear brethren, do not try to make the gospel tasteful to carnal minds. Hide not the offense of the cross, lest you make it of none effect. The angles and the corners of the cross, you know, that are sharp and kind of jab people at times, they are its strength. To pair them off, to make things smooth and easy, is to deprive it of power. Toning down is not the increase of strength, but the death of it. He had a great insight into keeping the gospel pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Because it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. I bet you Chloe's people heard about that. You little snitches. <laughs> You know that went on, right? What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ, and and we're starting to choose which ministry we want to follow, and I like this guy because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't yell and shout in the pulpit. He's, you know, he's kind of easy to listen to, and, and I like this church over here because they've got a great choir, and, you know, I like that church over there because their worship is like a rock concert, and, you know, this church has coffee in the, in the, uh, foyer area. And I like this, and I like that, as if the decision is up to us, and it's not. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And you're just going around choosing churches and ministries according to your selfish desires, your personal preferences. That's not what church is all about. We'll talk about that next week. I can't get into that right now. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name as if I am your salvation. And I love this about Paul. <laughs> the other, uh, just one day this last week, Tara and I were talking, and we, we were talking about this family and uh, from many years back. And so I guess she figured out my brain wasn't tracking, and she said, well, you know you did the funeral. 
And I said, I never did any such funeral. What are you talking about, right? And uh, she's, she's been down. She's had that conversation with me many times. I said, I have no memory of ever doing such a funeral. And she said, you did the funeral, Richard, and just left it at that. She knows. And I started thinking because it really bothered me. It, it took 10 or 15 minutes for me to start remembering, yeah, I guess I did a funeral. <laughs> you know, really weird. It was just something that was not in my mind at all. And I see that happening here with Paul. You know, sometimes we make these people out to be superheroes and they weren't. Paul had memory trouble. So when wives, when your husbands can't remember something, or if they swore you never told them, just be patient. Even the Apostle Paul was like this, you know. Paul had bad days too. Paul got grumpy and irritable too. Paul had trouble with relationships too. Just ask Barnabas. He says in verse 16, all right, I did baptize the household of Stephanus. How could you forget a whole household, Paul? And then look at what he says. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else, so just forget about it. I don't want to hear it. I'm just reading between the lines. For Christ did send me to bat for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of elegant wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And he's saying something very important here because, you know, the Greeks in Corinth, we've talked about this before, they were all about the orator. And they, they wanted someone to come and just thoroughly overwhelm them, you know, stimulate their intellect, move them, move their emotions from deep within, say some things that are just so profound that we just go, wow. And Paul says, I didn't give you what you wanted. Because if I gave you what you wanted, the cross of Christ would be emptied of its power. So I'm not going to say anything among you except Christ and Him crucified because that's what you need to be free from sin and to make it from heaven, to make it to heaven and find favor with your heavenly Father. And all of this extra stuff, all of the fluff that all of these ministries add it's taking away from the cross of Christ. It's taking away from the Word of God. And you can get so busy and so distracted and so disoriented. And your calendar can get so full that you forget what serving Christ is even all about because you're so busy doing good things. And we've all heard it many times how good can be the greatest enemy of God. And so Paul said, this is what you wanted, this is what the people were crying for, but I'm not giving it to you. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. And there's coming a day, you want all that fluff? You want to be impressed? You want to be, you want your intellect stimulated and tickled? You want to be moved with those great emotional, profound statements? You're going to see that the only thing that matters is the Word of God and preaching it and keeping it and letting truth be the very foundation of the ministry and the church. Don't move the foundation off the Word of God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Look at what he's saying. To the world, what we're doing here this morning looks foolish. It sounds like folly. It doesn't sound intelligent. It doesn't sound grand. 
They think it's foolishness. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. And Paul is saying, we didn't give the Jews what they want, and we don't give the Greeks what they want. We preach Christ crucified. And the Jews and the Greeks are saying, we didn't come to hear about some guy who died on a cross. What a loser. That's folly. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. That which is the wisdom of God is the foolishness to the world. Why in God's name do we want to compromise and water down the wisdom of God just to satisfy them? In case you haven't read the back of the book, we win. God is right. His word is true and will never pass away. And all of this stuff that the world presents as wisdom or power or status or success, one day it will all burn up and they will see just how foolish and vain it was to trust in anything other than God. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul's, you know, he's, he's telling them kind of the culture and what's happening in the church. And in Philippians 1, we see another picture from Paul of what this produces in the church. Verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. There are others of goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. But the former pro proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. I, I, I've heard this again and again and again from people who have firsthand knowledge that some of the worst places in churches today are the headquarters of denominations. And I've heard it about the AG denomination. I've heard it, heard it about the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination. That when you, when you really get involved with the inner circle and you're there, uh, in, in the headquarters, it's just jealousy and rivalry and one trying to outdo the other and one trying to stab the back of another. And it's no different than the world. But it's worse because they're pretending to be Christian. He says the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. You know, sometimes I'd give you the results of certain surveys and polls, and the guys that take the polls, you know, they are careful to explain that sometimes the numbers are, are skewed. And the way that the numbers are skewed is because they say, okay, well, attendance here is up and attendance here is down and money here is up and money here is down. But it's not total reality because people are changing churches so much. And so it's, you're really just tracking movement but it's the same group of people. They just migrate to different churches when they get upset and leave, and they're not faithful or committed to anything. They're looking for what church services me the best or suits me or pleases me the best, and going to church is not a high calling like the Bible declares it to be. And so there's rivalry and competition and we've got to get our numbers up and better than the church down the street. And, and wow, Paul's in prison. We can take some of his followers and make them our followers. We can finally get ahead of Paul. And Paul said, I don't care. He didn't play the game of politics at all. He said, the only thing I care about, that whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, in that I rejoice. 
and I'm not going to get involved in all of the mudslinging and all of the criticism and all of the rivalry among ministries and churches. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And what he is saying there is, I didn't come and present myself as the macho man, as the answer man, as the savior that had come to, you know, bring your church to greatness and glory. I didn't come trying to sell myself or brand myself. I didn't come trying to outdo Barnabas or Apollos. I came and I just wanted to know one thing among you, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. My presence before you was weak and trembling. I didn't want you focused on me. I want you focused on God so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Remember, we started down this vein on 1 Samuel chapter 16 when Samuel needs to anoint a new king. Saul had sinned and been rejected by the Lord. And so Samuel goes to uh, the house of David's father and he, he looks on Eliab and Eliab is the firstborn, the oldest, and he's tall and handsome and strong. And he looked at Eliab and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance and on the height, because I have what? I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as man sees. And I want to tell you something. The Lord does not see churches as, God, as man sees churches. And what man thinks is so great and so powerful and so mighty Reminds me of that one letter in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, one of the seven letters to the churches where Jesus rebukes them and he says, you guys have a reputation of being alive. Man, a lot of things going, you're on the move, you're, you're getting these results. He said, you don't even realize you're dead. <laughs> you are dead on the inside. You don't know how bad off you are. Because man goes by appearance. And we think money is success. More people is success. All of this flush, fluff, fluff, and, and uh, extracurricular programs for the community, we think that's success. When the church is to be the habitation of God, we are here to worship God, to study his word, and to love and serve one another, and preach the gospel when we are out in the world. That's what we are to focus on. And it's not some society for me to realize my greatness. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I know for a fact God is more pleased with some churches of 20 and 30 people than he is with other churches of 20,000. There's nothing wrong with big churches. I'm not saying that. Big churches are not evil. But yet at the same time, how did they get that big? How did they attract so many people? Did they compromise? Are they appealing to man's flesh and selfishness in some way? It makes you ask the question. When you look at Corinthians and Timothy and Titus and Ephesians, he, he, he's talking to churches that are very intimately involved, so intimate that you can stand up and feel safe confessing your sins one to another, right? You can't do that in a church of a thousand people. You, you don't have the relationships 
to do that. And so all of the instruction that we see in these epistles, they are two smaller gatherings. And that is how the church is to live and breathe and interact with one another. So you, you kind of have to ask the question. You can't make a general statement that big churches are wrong, but you do have to ask, so how are you going to have this level of intimacy and accountability when you're so big and people come and grow as strangers and don't even talk to anybody else? And there's no relationship there. Who's really getting the work of God done? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. You know, God's people, the true churches, are churches like us sitting in this room. We're not the pretty people. We're not the wealthy. We're not the politically powerful. We're not famous. Very few people even know who we are or that we even exist. But those are the people that God chooses to work in and work through. You know why? Because when you have natural fame, natural wealth, earthly status, earthly influence, authority, you are so tempted to take the credit to yourself and depend upon your natural attributes instead of trusting in God. And so God doesn't choose the ones who are wise according to worldly standards. He doesn't choose the mighty and the powerful and the rich. Yes, there are always exceptions. But he says in verse 27, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. What is Paul describing here? God wants to build a church that no man can claim as his own or take credit for. That's what God is after. That's what God is working for. It's a church where the only explanation is that God, not man, was the builder. And the power of God is going to use congregations just like this one here. And people are going to say, how did you do that? You're a bunch of nobodies who have nothing. No influence, no power, no might, no status, no... How did you do that? And there's only going to be one explanation. God is in our midst. And that's the church that God wants to build. Not the one that's successful in the world's eyes. So what, what really is church? What is the one discriminator between the true, true church and the false church? Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So what makes a true church, a church that God is proud of, a church that God is pleased with, what makes that kind of a church? It's not wealth. It's not numbers. It's not programs. The successful church is the church where he abides, where he is. There I am among them. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We want to be a church where Jesus is here, dwelling among us, walking among us, that whenever we come together, we know his presence, we hear his voice, we feel his worship rising in our hearts, we feel his peace and rest descending upon us as his people. That's the kind of church we want to be. We're not here to fulfill some sort of a program. We are here to engage and encounter God in a holy intercourse with him. That's why we come to church. 
He says, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them. Don't touch the unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will do what? He will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. God doesn't dwell in sinful dwellings. There's preparation that must take place in our hearts. We have to be doers of the word, obedient, and then he will come and make our home with us. That's why there's so few in churches nowadays. Because they don't want to come out and be separate. They don't want to live holy lives. They want to do whatever they want to do. And you know what? God is not there. He simply is not there. It's the facade of a church, but it's not the true, living, vibrant church where God dwells. Remember Exodus 33, verse 15? Moses is praying and he says, Lord, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? that we are distinct? What separates us as the church is not our great intellect, influence, fame, power, wealth, statistics. What makes us distinct and special and separate from all of the other nations in the world is that God dwells in us. And if we don't have that, we have nothing. And Moses said, God, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. I want God or I don't want anything at all. I want God or I want nothing to do with religion. Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct from every other people on the face of the earth? So as a church, that's our passion. That's our preparation. That's what we seek. We want God to inhabit us as a holy assembly. I want to end on this one story taken from Spurgeon's biography. During the 1880s, a group of American ministers visited England, prompted especially by a desire to hear some of the celebrated preachers of that land. During this time, I mean, it wasn't just Spurgeon. They had some fantastic, outstanding preachers in England. Kind of a shame to see England's spiritual condition today, isn't it? How far, far they've fallen. And so it says, on a Sunday morning, they attended the city temple where Dr. Joseph Parker was the pastor. Some 2,000 people filled the building, and Parker's forceful personality dominated the service. His voice was commanding, his language descriptive, his imagination lively. Boy, I want to go to that church. His manner animated. The sermon was scriptural. The congregation hung upon his words, and the Americans came away saying, What a wonderful preacher is Joseph Parker. In the evening, they went to hear Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. The building was much larger than the city temple. See, big is not necessarily bad. The congregation was more than twice the size. Spurgeon's voice was much more expressive and moving, and his oratory noticeably superior. But they soon forgot all about the great building. They forgot all about the congregation, the magnificent voice. They even overlooked their intention to compare the various features of the two preachers. And when the service was over, they found themselves saying, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus Christ. That's what we want to be. We, won't, we don't want people walking in and say, oh, what a great church. They are so wonderful, and they have this, and they have that, and... When people come in, it's got to be so predominant that God is here in our midst. And that's what makes us distinct. 
And we want people walking away saying how good God is, not how good Westgate Chapel is. Father, we thank you for your presence with us because we really, we know that you abide within us. We know that you answer our prayers. Father, we pray that you would protect us from the seduction of heresy, of blending the holy with the profane, just to appease people in this world that don't even want to serve you. Father, we pray that we will understand in this society and in this culture where everyone is accepted and everyone is made to feel included and nobody is is made to feel like they did anything wrong. Father, we understand that the lines between light and darkness, good and evil, godly and Satan, we understand those lines are very tight, very sharp, very sure. There is good and evil, and there is a continual war going on, and there's coming a day when Jesus will come back, and with the fire that comes from his mouth, from his word, the evil and the sinful will be destroyed and consumed. Father, we know there's a judgment day coming, and we know that it's folly It's foolishness to in any way try to compromise just to appease people. We want to please you. We want you living in our midst. We want you worshiped in our midst. Lord, we're nobodies. But it's in the nobodies that you can manifest your power the greatest. And so we come, we ask that you would come and manifest your power among us and that you would receive all of the glory. It wouldn't go to any man or any human being. That people would know that what makes us distinct is that God is in our midst. And we don't know how that group of people did it. It must have been the Lord. Father, please make us your church. We don't know how to come in or go out. We don't know what we're doing. But we know you do. And we know that you are the architect and the builder of this assembly. And so we surrender to your work. And as we go now, Father, we ask that you would keep us safe, that you would fill us and surround us with your presence, that you would heal the sick bodies, heal Neil and Rosie and Susan, continue to bring peace and comfort to the Bolins. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.